Um, this afternoon we're going to continue um, with um, some live experience from the field. And, and we're starting with Martin Black, who's the Senior Sound Supervisor and Technical Consultant at Sky Television. Martin. Thank you very much, Martin. Good afternoon. I um, hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, this morning, finished with Patrick Warrington from Calrec talking about the Hydra 2 network. Uh, I believe this afternoon's sessions generally are about real-world implementations of some of the technologies that were talked about this morning. Um, and the first of those is an implementation of that Hydra 2 network that Patrick Warrington described to you. Uh, this is the implementation that we put into what was originally known as the Harlequin 1 project uh, at its inception back in about six years ago. Um, it then became called Sky Studios, just for the record. Um, so the, the names are used interchangeably here. Um, so I don't have many slides, um, just a few scene setters really. Um, and then Mark and I, the, Mark and I are going to have a Q&A &A kind of conversation, so a slightly different format for this half hour, just to break it up. So Sky Studios, uh, apart from anything else, is, uh, is billed as the greenest broadcasting complex in Europe. Um, one, of the, one of the elements of that you can see here are these large funnel-type structures, which are actually are used for natural ventilation for the studios, which are on the ground floor, and indeed the office spaces further up. Um, what you can't see on that picture is the... Um, is the wind vane, the wind generator, which is on one end of the building, uh, which is a rather large structure and I believe actually runs most of the lighting in the building most of the time. Um, Rumour has it that as this building is just under the flight path for Heathrow 27, left run, 27 right runway um, and not far from Heathrow, it's actually in uh, Brentford, Isleworth, around that way, uh, just behind the Gillette building on the A4, in fact, um, which is near the Heathrow flight path and I believe that they had to make a modification to the software in the ground radar at Heathrow because of the, the wind vane going round uh, the, the height that it was above the building. Um, it mentions in the description of my talk about the, the principal design concepts of this building which was make, shape and share. Um, and if you go to the building, you'll see that it's worked so that the make is the studio's level, which is on the ground and first floors, and then the second and third floors are the shape bit, where edit suites, audio dubbing suites, uh, and other mainly post-production areas and graphics uh, live. And then on the top fourth floor is the master control transmission platform control areas, where the share bit happens. So that was the, what the, the sort of concept. What this building was built for was to replace uh, a, a sort of a, a, a growing but rather sprawled uh, complex that Sky became after its initial beginnings in the very late 80s on this what was then a light industrial, a, 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 a light industrial unit site and slowly Sky bought up all the units one by one uh, and ended up as a rather uh, splayed out facility. Um, this, so all those were sort of conversions of, of uh, areas into technical buildings. This was the first purpose-built building from the ground up. Um, the, our Arup was the main uh, architectural uh, partners of, of it and uh, Sony were the design partners for what was called the TFO, or Technical Fit-Out which was the, the complete technical infrastructure for the whole building, uh, not just the, uh, the broadcast part, but all the, all the technical facilities right through. Uh, this is one of the equipment rooms. Um, the, the building is designed such that uh, in, there are equipment rooms on each of the uh, floors in the centre of the building, so the bits that don't get the windows and then office space and edit suites and that are built around the outside. So there's at least one equipment room on each floor. Uh, on the first floor is where all the equipment for the studios and control rooms for the live section is housed. Um, and this is about half to two-thirds of the whole length of the building. 
and I think there's something like 15 or 20 equipment bays in there. So all the studio equipment uh, divided studio by studio for all the individual stuff, and then there's shared bays for uh, all the technical facilities that spread across all the studios. Uh, and there's two, two complete equipment bays that are purely down to all the studio audio stuff. Um, that's just an example of a small part of one of the back of those bays. So you've got about 20 of those on each floor as a very rough approximation of the scale of the technical fit out. This is a shot of the uh, audio, one of the two audio rows of bays with the, in the bottom of the picture here, you can see all the Calrec Hydra 2 cores. Well, not all of them, actually. Um, they're actually spread out uh, per, per pair of studios. So the, the, the far one is Studio 1, and you'll notice there's a blank for Studio 2, which I'll come on to in a minute. And then Studio 3 and Studio 4. The two next two ones are two central cores, uh, which don't have consoles attached to them. And then we have Studio 5 and Studio 6, and you can't see Studio 7 and Studio 8, or the ICA and the Bulletin Studio. So there's actually quite a few more. I think there's a total of 11 altogether. Uh, that's just a bit of a close-up shot of the two central cores. The whole lot, uh, everything is connected with single-core uh, LC fibre uh, throughout. So all the I.O. boxes, be they local, on gallery floors or around the building, are all connected in the same way. And one of the features of the Hydra, uh, Hydra 2 Calrec network which I believe isn't necessarily the case with some of the uh, competing networks, is that you, there's no um, proprietoriness between where, you, excuse me, between where you plug in a particular I.O. facility. Uh, you can put it into any port anywhere on the network, and it's completely ambidextrous, if you like. That's a very useful feature when you have, for instance, floating I.O. that you might want to use in different areas and into different galleries. But we'll come on to that when I uh, talk about the the network control structures that we are, we're using. Uh, that's a view of one of the studio, live studio control rooms, sound control rooms. They, they're all identical in technical facilities. They all have a, an 88 fader uh, Calric Apollo console um, and the other facilities that you can see. Um, there's, a, there's a spot on uh, system used for playing out um, Graham's music, Graham's. Anybody who works on television knows exactly what I mean. We still call it grams, although it moved on from carts and various hard disk devices to generally networked and certainly uh, file-based uh, systems now. Um, loudness, loudness is taken care of with an RTW meter because all these, all these control rooms are fully 5.1 capable. They can handle up to 16 or 20 outside sources, all with two sets of surround and two sets of stereo, uh, and about 8 or 10 playback devices. We use EVS uh, machines for server and uh, slow-mo playbacks in the studios. Um, and obviously uh, the microphone section tends to be here, but obviously it's a very signable system. Um, and then there's TFT up, uh, upstand metering, which is all again cust uh, user configurable. So that's the sort of size of control room. And I think we've got, uh, well, the, the, the studio setup was designed with eight control rooms and eight studio floors. Uh, we have equipped all but two of the control rooms and now all of the studio floors. So we've got six control rooms and eight studio floors. That might sound slightly strange, but there's, a, there's actually a very logical reason for that. If you think about it, when you change from one program to another on a studio floor, you have to take one of the sets out put the new set in and then completely relight it, which takes quite a long time. Whereas to take the people out of a gallery and turn it around to do another program takes about 10 minutes if they get a move on. And you can have a new production ready to rehearse in there. So you actually end up requiring a bigger balance of galleries against studio floors, sorry, the other way around. So you need a bigger number of studio floors so that you can turn around the galleries to work with more than one floor in a given time period. So the mathematics of it kind of works out quite well. Um, so just to give a quick, quick rundown of the scale of how we're using the Hydra 2 network. So we've effectively got three independent networks, but one of them is the primary. So we've got a, a two-console, two-core network, which is dedicated to Studio 6. 
and Studio 60's floor, and that does Spice Walk's News HQ. It was originally designed to be part of the main network, um, but it went on air first and was uh, split away to be standalone to allow us to continue work without any hindrance on the rest of the system. And it actually grew into a, a point where it made more sense to keep it as a separate network um, because that's on the air 18 hours a day, every day, and therefore it's quite useful for it not to impinge on how we use the rest of the network in terms of things like updates and main system maintenance. So there, it's operated as a separate network, but could, it could actually be part of the main network. There's then five general purpose galleries, as I mentioned, um, with, uh, sev with seven studio floors. And then there's most recent addition was uh, an, another gallery on the third floor, which uses uh, automation uh, via um, uh, the Vis uh, Grass Valley Vision Mixer into um, CSCP, isn't it? I think, the uh, automation interface that the, uses the Caric system. And uh, that's uh, used for generating sports news bulletins into both Sky News, Sports News and third party takers. So that again operates as a separate standalone system. But they're all based on the Hydra 2 core technology. The, the main general purpose uh, routing system has two router cores, which you remember you saw in that equipment bay. Um, cores 9 and 10 are like two master cores that share the, the network load and join it all together. So two central cores, nine consoles, console router cores feed into those. There's something like 25,000 uh, I.O. and Hydro Patch Bay ports on the system altogether. Um, there's, there's a, that might look like a very high number, but when you consider that there's about eight studios operating, um, they can all have 16, or in one case 20, outside sources, each of those outside sources would have 16 audios on it. Stereo mix, stereo M&E, 5.1 full mix and a 5.1 M&E split into 16 audios. So once you start adding up all the maths and adding all the playback devices with the same configuration, you actually get quite a big audio count. So it is quite a big network to manage. There's a total of 68 IO frames of various flavours plugged in around the building across all four floors. Um, and there's nine galleries with consoles and ten studio floors. So the overall structure looks something like this. Uh, as I mentioned, there's two standalone elements, which are the ones with the yellow background. There's the Sky Sports News, which was recently updated to be Sky Sports News HQ, which actually has two studio floors. It has a newsroom that it uses most of the time on the first floor of the building, and also uh, Studio 6's floor, which is next to the, the control room, which it uses for the bigger programmes like the Soccer Saturdays and the Midweek Specials, etc. Um, the other standalone setup is this bulletin studio I mentioned, uh, which is up on the third floor. Uh, the rest of the network is all part of the main network that is joined together through Core 9 and Core 10 that you can see here. So uh, the ICA is a specific console on the main network. The ICA is the International Commentary Area. It's another area on the third floor of the building uh, which has 10 voiceover booths nominally associated with it which does multiple uh, simultaneous football commentaries for things like Champions League and the Saturday afternoon football. So when Sky's doing Champions League with say eight matches um, some of the commentators will be at the grounds but a lot of them will be back in, in, in the voiceover booths local to the ICA. And the ICA will mix all those matches, whether the commentary is local or remote. They'll mix the commentary in with the effects, all in 5.1. So we can have up to 8 or 10 5.1 football streams being mixed on that one console. But because that console is part of the network, it can, it can interface with all the rest of the systems, both in terms of inputs and outputs, because there's obviously communication circuits associated with all this live stuff as well as the program circuits so this feeds into commentators ears there's a clean non non effects mixed commentary that we have to provide back out to the EBU again which they repurpose with pictures for agencies so there's a lot of contractual requirements on top of what actually goes to air which the uh, the network allows us to distribute back so up at the top in this main network We've got uh, master control area, the EBU commentary feeds, um, some mobile floating I.O. boxes, 
and enhanced control rooms are the, uh, the, the areas that do the interactive red button stuff. So they take some of the signals from the ICA as well. And the rest of the diagram, let's clear those off, the rest of the diagram is all the studio cores and studio floors. Um, you'll notice, if you look closely, that the two pink devices are the master two cores. Uh, core 9 is actually the, the overall master, but there's a, a trunk link between the two, so that there's actually a, a, a highway, if you like, of audios, which effectively makes the cores just look like one uh, resource to the network. So any I.O. device on that network is technically available to any other area and any other console. Um, the way that the infrastructure is arranged and the architecture of the network is such, if you look closely, the, the floors for each of the studios actually feeds into the central core, not to the local console core. The concept there is that the studio floors are not owned by their galleries, so gallery four and floor four are not uh, joined together, if you like, other than physically. So any gallery could be working with floor four at any given time, and gallery four could be working with another floor. So to, to, to allow us to, for instance, take one control room, one gallery offline, it was made more sense not to have the floor I.O. go through that gallery's central core, local core as well. Does that sort of make sense? Good. Um, I think that's probably most of um, what the architecture side of it is, but I know Mark wants to quiz me about some of the uh, control structures and things. That yeah, can I pick you up there. on some details? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, let's start with um, what were the production workflow requirements <coughs> that were addressed by installing this network? <coughs> um, one of the very early design requirements that was thrown at us was that uh, they wanted to be able to do, use this facility of having studio floors that were interchangeable uh, for reasons that I mentioned to do with the, the time efficiency of having sets swapped in and out and having galleries switched between one floor and another. And we needed to make that as simple as possible for operators so they weren't having to program anything. Um, they just had a, a simple mechanism to switch between floors. <coughs> Problem with that was that we also wanted to be able to use um, what we generically call snapshots, but they're called chosen memory files in the CalRex system, but I'll use the term snapshots because I think that probably is, is a more universal expression for the a blanket um, device I'm talking about. So if you have a snapshot of your program and you did that program with floor four, then if you came back to do the program the next week, but you were using floor, floor three, obviously the snapshot wouldn't work. So you'd have to have a different snapshot for each floor. Well, we wanted a mechanism that we could avoid doing that so we could have a transparent way of switching the floor independently, but it still worked with the snapshot. So we discussed it with Calric and came up with this concept of alias files, which are basically just lookup tables. Very simple, they have two entries have a name of a real port and the name of an aliased port. And an alias is like a virtual name. Probably best if I give you an example, a simple example. Let's say that Studio Floor 4 has a source called Microphone 1. Now, in the system, that's called Floor 4 Microphone 1. In the alias file, you just call it Mic 1. And you load in an alias file that points your Mic 1 at Floor 4's Mic 1. So you'd have a whole file for floor four, which made mic one, floor four, mic one, made your mic two, floor four, mic two. But it just says mic one, and that's what you snapshot. Simple. So when you recall the snapshot, it has an alias, not the real port name, and then you load in one of the alias tables to point to a particular floor. So as soon as you switch out that table and load in a different one, all your ports point, all your sources point to a different floor and they're still labelled the same thing. So, I don't know if that's... Uh, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, um, what level of networking knowledge did you have before you set about this? The forerunner, if you like, of this, I suppose you could say it was almost a rehearsal now, in a way, was when, when I first got involved in this side of things from 
being operational for about 20 odd years. Um, when we first decided to do live HD as Sky, uh, 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 we actually went on air with our HD in 2006 in the end, but it was about 2004 that we, myself and a colleague Keith Lane, started to look into the audio side of, of uh, the audio aspects of an, HD, of an HD service. And the idea was that we were going to convert two of our standard studios into HD studios, so our aspect, our bit of that was to do work out how we were going to do the 5.1 side of it. And, and we uh, specified for those studios Calrex then Hydra One network, which used the Alpha console. Uh, although it was a network system, what we actually needed the network side of it for was, ironically, was simply to give us a large enough number of ports for the 5.1 side of it. I explained a few minutes ago how we end up with a large number of ports when we're working in 5.1. Um, and with that system, we needed to add in some Hydra stage boxes to give us the I.O. There were two studios. The studio's still there, then they're still on air. They don't use the discrete um, 5.1 that we're using throughout Harlequin 1. Sky Studios Harlequin 1 is completely discrete audio. There's no Dolby E anywhere in the building. It gets decoded as it comes in from the OBs in our master control, and the workflow flows all the way around the building with discrete um, audio circuits. And it only gets encoded right at the end if we need to send it back out to an OB or currently for our transmission system, which was what they call lift and shift from the old system. So it wasn't part of the new design when we built Sky Studios. We actually moved the old one across. And that's in the throes of being converted to a new, completely new system now, which, which will accept the discrete uh, 5.1 or Dolby E. So um, when we first built the Studio 6 and 7, as they then were, we had two Hydra 1 systems with two uh, Alpha consoles, but we didn't even join them together because we were simply trying to increase our, our I.O. count. And that's really the only networking um, knowledge that we had before we, we set about this slightly larger task. Slightly larger, yeah. What, what were the main criteria that drove the choice of this networking technology? Um, I mentioned a couple of things already that were particularly attractive. One of the things we, we really didn't want to get into, into was the problem of having to connect a particular I.O. resource into a particular port on the network, mm -hmm. because especially with a network this size, that would mean that our operators would have to start to learn things about networking. They'd need to go up onto the equipment room to go to fibre patch bays. Um, we wanted a system that made none of that necessary. Um, bearing in mind that part of the whole um, overall building design concept was that there were lots of fibre points uh, on all the floors so that a, a, a production could go and do a band next to the canteen on the third floor or whatever, and we would plug in some I.O. for the audio and they'd plug in some fibres for the cameras. So we had these points coming back into the router. We wanted people to be able to take an, a, a mobile I.O. box, one of those four on the left there, and um, plug it up, power it up locally, plug the fibres in, and it just appear, and it appear as that box. So if you'd done a snapshot with that box on before, you got it back without having to plug anything. So that was one of the requirements. Um, another one was the, obviously the, the floors and gallery swapping, for which we needed to design something with the eventual supplier, which we successfully did with the alias system. And there was um, another uh, aspect of this, which was to be able to use outputs from consoles uh, to other consoles. And this is something else that um, Patrick Warrington talked about before lunch. This was the concept that went through various guises, uh, also known as Blue Links. Uh, virtual patch bays, but it ended up being called hydro patch bays, but it was, it was exactly the same core technology. Um, for this, you need to know a little bit about <coughs> how um, control systems control routers and audio systems. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. But, um, <laughs> we have a very big control system, broadcast control system at Sky, which is actually the BNCS system, which was originally the BBC proprietary system. It was then taken over by Siemens and became commercially available, and it's now run by, uh, by Atos, everybody's heard for various non-broadcast purposes, probably. Um, 
We've probably got about 150 workstations. It's basically a, a GUI user interface that is used everywhere, master control studios, edit suites, the lot. Um, and it basically brings, into, brings under one control interface all the various bits of equipment, routers, comm circuits, codecs, uh, audio routers, audio desks. So it has proprietary panels to control whatever equipment you use. Now, it uses standard protocols where possible to do things. So, for instance, if you simply want to control a router, then you have input ports, you have output ports, and there's protocols that do that. Um, the one that we use with the CowRx system is, the, is originally a ProBell protocol called SWP08, but it's a fairly industry standard protocol. So we can talk to the, the Hydra 2 system and we can route input ports to output ports using standard proto, uh, router protocol. What's a little bit more complicated about an audio network in particular is that it's not just input ports and output ports. You have something in between, which is this bunk DSP, which is the mixer. So as well as having input ports available to route to output ports, you also have the product of what the mixer makes, which is generally output buses. So you have main buses, maybe you have direct outs of groups and channels, auxiliary outputs, track sends. All these you want to make available as well. But the problem is that because they're not input ports, the control system can't route them to output ports. The central internal control system obviously used, has no problem and uses them exactly the same as it does input ports, but you can't do that with an external system. So what the Hydra patch bays do is they allow you to have virtual ports that you can route your buses to. Once you've then routed your buses to these ports as destinations, if you like, they then become sources or input ports. So hence the virtual bit, they're two things at once. So what you've now got is outputs from the console that look like more input ports. That means that you can then use your control system to route them to outputs. So it gives you that ability to, to treat them in the same way as real ports, hence the virtual patch bay name at one point. So that was, that's the basic concept of, of why we needed to do that. But the other thing it allows you to do is even within the, the CalREC network itself, it means that you can make available, as, Cal, as Patrick was saying earlier, you can make available all your buses to other consoles on the network. So within the CalREC routing system, you can also see all those resources. So for instance, if the international commentary area has got clean commentaries on, on its track send buses, and one of the studios wants, needs to pick up that clean commentary to do its own mix, with the incoming effects, say, then they can actually access that track send as another source, as though it was an input port to their console, and put that onto a fader and mix it in. Mm. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, sorry, <coughs> conscious of time, but I'm keen to know how the audio network interacted with the video infrastructure. The, this is interesting. This is, this is a thought that's been through my mind quite a few times during this morning's discussion, actually, that um, with a an audio for television uh, network like this, the, the audio within a control room tends to be very much an audio only operation and therefore all the, the bits that work for a, a normal audio studio can work for a TV studio with, with obvious um, riders like we tend to use a lot of embedding and de-embedding. And therein lies the key to the answer to your question because once we come outside of the, of the local studio area where we've been mixing and routing, we then need to put the, the audio back with the pictures where we got a lot of it from in the first place. So we basically use SDI technology, serial digital interface. It's the, di it's the digital version of vision, if you like. Um, within that, there's space within what's called the vertical ancillary space, the bank space, to put lots of things, including audio information. And there's actually space for at least 16 audios in the standard uh, 1080 i50 HD SDI signal. And rather conveniently, all these I.O. modules can have um, embedder and de-embedder cards fitted. And they can produce, uh, they can take in two streams of either input SDI or output SDI. And we use those extensively to get all the uh, outside source and playback sources into the Hydra system. So in terms of how we interface outside of the 
studios, it tends to be mostly SDI routing. Because apart from anything else, it keeps it nice and simple because as long as you get all your audios back with your picture and it's in sync, it should stay like that. And the great advantage is, of course, that you're not trying to route audio and video separately. You make one video route, you switch all those embedded audios at the same time. And it's actually a very convenient way to handle what can get quite complicated if, uh, if you have it separated out. So it makes an awful lot of sense to use horses, to use the right horse for the right course, if you like, to do your audio only where it's, you are wanting to process the audio separately, but to marry the two together for transmission around the building and out further afield. Mm, great. Um, this will be my last question. Mm -hmm. um, how big an investment did you have to make in training so that people could use the system? This was really a completely new sort of grassroots up learning process for everybody. We introduced a fair amount of newer technology, but I've always sort of emphasised the point that what we were really doing was an evolution rather than a revolution. People were already used to the Hydra One system and the whole concept of, of using a, a touchscreen to make audio routes. Uh, using digital audio, etc. So a lot of it was kind of background already for Hydra 2. And as far as the new concepts were concerned, we've mentioned two particular here earlier, um, the concept of using alias files to switch floors. And I should add that the other thing we use alias files for is to switch voiceover booths, because we have 14 voiceover booths, and all of those booths can work into any of the control rooms, and we use alias files to do that bit as well. Um, and the other concept I mentioned was hybrid patch bays. So those were two um, elements that we needed to add to the, 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 the skill set, if you like. And we made great use of the broadcast control system to simplify that process. So the user can now operate the BCS touchscreen and basically has a column of floors and a column of galleries and they can only obviously route to their own gallery, but they can select any floor that somebody else hasn't already selected, and the control system will actually load the correct alias files for them. They can watch it happen if they go to the right page on the desk interface, and they can override it themselves, but they don't ever need to go there because they can actually do all this through BNCS. So we had to, had to develop, or Calric had to develop, a mechanism that could do this kind of um, control from an external um, system, bearing in mind that the only control mechanism that we had up till now was the SWP08 to do routing. But that can only do routing, and what this was trying to do was file manipulation and various control uh, con uh, protocol um, control. So it, uh, we, uh, we said what we needed them to load, and Calric came up with using uh, Ember, which is an extended version of Burr, which I believe was originally... Uh, developed by LSB in uh, Germany. So um, they use the Ember protocol that BNCS was taught to talk, to talk if you like, into the uh, Calric control system, and that allows you to use intelligent interlocking that's built into the broadcast control system to load uh, both uh, alias files, and it can also load snow sh show snapshots if you choose to do that. Um, it does a few other things as well, and it can do routing, but we use the, uh, the old ProBell uh, interface for that. Brilliant. Martin, thank you very much You're indeed. Welcome.